So this is probably one of my favorite Sundays out of the year because I love vision. I'm talking about my wife can tell you I think about vision all of the time. Like I'm always thinking about what's next, where we could go, how we could do it, what we're becoming. Like I, I dream about it. It is probably the principal thing in my life that is, uh, that is like flowing out of my life. Like I love vision. But God has a vision for the church we know. But I need you to know also that God has a vision for your life. That God is not just wanting to move in this place, he's wanting to move in you too, right? So God wants something for you, not just the church, but I know that when God does something through you, the church will benefit, amen? So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about vision, and typically what happens is we do this a couple of times a year, and I'll have all of our numbers up, and it'll be like, man, we've done this, and we've done that, and everyone's like, ha, you know, I didn't even know we were doing all that stuff, and we show the impact that we've been having throughout the year on the community, but as I was putting this message together, God was kind of like just downloading in me, and when I got to the end, there were no numbers, And, and it's funny because It really wasn't as much about the vision of the church that God wanted me to focus on today. It was the vision of your life. That really, instead of it being so much about us, today I want to make it a little bit more about you. That you in the room know that God has called you. He's equipping you, that you're worthy And that he's chosen you and hand-selected you from all of the people that exist to be a part of a movement that is so profound that you actually have the opportunity to be a part of history. That it's not a small thing, but a great thing that you can be a part of. I can remember as a child wanting to be someone great so that I could be a part of history so that my name could be remembered But God is showing me that that dream that I put in you wasn't a dream of athleticism. It was a dream of eternity. That for all of us in the room, God is handwriting our names in the the Lamb's book of life. But he's wanting to add to us. So he wants to do something through us. And the Bible speaks all about what God wants to do for you. And there are four things that are undeniable about God. Like, you, I, if you came today and you're like, I, listen, this music, I'll, I'll explain it like uh, I had an atheist who came to our church when we were at the school say one time. He said, listen, it's like a concert. And then this dude gets up, does this motivational speech, and I just feel good all week. That might be your perspective. But, but I, what I want you to know is this. He's alive. And he has something. He has something for you. And I want you to write these things down. Because we believe here at this church, we've got them hanging from our ceiling. We talk about them all the time. There are four things that God wants for you. And the first thing that God wants for you guys is he wants you to know him. The first vision, the first thing that God wants for you is he wants you to know him. And I'm not talking about know him intellectually in your heart. I'm talking about knowing him relationally in, or in your head, but in your heart, where God wants to be alive in your heart. Relationships aren't alive in your head because how many of you know when your relationship gets to your head, it's all bad, right? You're thinking about all kinds of stuff. But when it's in your heart and it's flowing from your heart, it's healthy, it's whole, and it's full of hope and joy, right? So God wants you to know him in a relational way. He doesn't want you to know about him. He wants you to know what he likes and doesn't like, his his hot buttons and his cold buttons. He wants you to know him like you know your friend or, or, or your husband or your wife or your children. God wants you to know him in an intimate and in a real way. He really, wants you to, he really wants you to see who he really is and that he is a good father. He is a faithful friend. He does stick closer than a brother. 
But that means that we've got to get into a relationship with him. And being in a relationship with him means we've got to learn the language that he speaks. Because it's hard to be in relationship with someone if you don't speak the same language, which is why we got to get into our word. We talk about the first 15. So when you wake up in the morning, wake up 15 minutes early. Five minutes, listen to a worship song, man. Listen, nothing gets me in the presence of God like music. Come on, right? And then read for five minutes and then pray about what you read. You might pray, Lord, I don't know what I just read. But God, you're alive. Be with me this day. And, and God, I, listen, tomorrow when I read, help me to understand it a little bit more. You understand what I'm saying? And God will do it. He'll, he will open it up. The Bible says that the veil is over the eyes of the unbeliever. God, I gave my heart to you. Remove the veil so that I can see your word. And then God wants you to live in freedom. The Bible says whom the son has set free is free indeed, right? And we say find family because we know that living in freedom comes through relationships with others. We know in James chapter 5, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Because the truth of the matter is we all have things from our past that are holding us back. There are some things in your life that if they weren't in your life, your life would be better. And God wants to set you free from those. And what I've learned is just because you've given your life to Jesus and you're free, I know a lot of people who are free but walking in bondage. There's a difference between living free and being free. God wants you to live in freedom. Amen? And then the third thing God wants is he wants you to discover your purpose. You were created on purpose with a purpose. You are not an accident. I don't care how you got here, right? I'm, I don't know, my mom's still here, but listen, my mom had me. I think she, she got pregnant with me. She was 16. She did not mean to get pregnant. But you know what? God had a plan and a purpose anyway. And God had a plan and a purpose for your life. And God has one. And, and, and this is probably going to be a little bit startling to a lot of you, but you can go fact check this if you want. But 89% of Christians don't know what their purpose is. Nearly 9 out of 10 people have no idea why they're alive on the earth. That's a lot. If I were to get 10 people here and I'd be like, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you guys, one person. But ultimately, what God wants is he wants to use you so that you can make a difference. Because the greatest, of the, the greatest thing that we get to experience is making a difference. Because it's when we make a difference in the life of somebody else and we're able to see their reactions, when we're able to see what God is doing in their life, when we're able to see the transformation, it begins to do something inside of us that wells up in us, that creates a joy in us and a fervor in us that is so mind-blowing. It's awesome. You're like, man, let's do that again. I was watching videos yesterday of people like giving stuff away. Dude went to a, he went to Dairy Queen and was like, give me a hundred hot dogs. And he gave them away. It was like 100 bucks. I was like, I'm doing that. But you see what I'm saying? It's, it's like make a difference, make a difference, make a difference. Everybody say make a difference. make a difference. You were created to make a difference. I need you to know that there will never be another you. The design, that we used to say the mold has been broken. Because the world couldn't handle two of me. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm saying. They broke the mold when they made you. So whether you think you're all that or not, God thinks you're all that. He thinks you're all that. So, so we were created to know him, find free or live in freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. But my question for all of you in the room is how are you doing? So today I wanted to do a little bit of a check. Because I think we don't do this enough. How are you doing? Like, how are you doing with your relationship with God? Like, how are you doing with your past? What is it that you need to let go of that you just seem to can't let go of? 
How are you doing with walking in your purpose or making a difference? Like, how are you doing for real? You know, it's kind of like an inventory. How, listen, you can't expect your marriage to be good if you don't check and see how your marriage is going. Can't expect your relationships with one another to be good if you're not checking in on each other. And it's the same thing with God. And some of you may be like, man, listen, I, I, was, I was just in City Steps, PT. I, I remember all this, what you're saying right now. That's great, but how are you doing? How are you doing? Look at your neighbor and say, how are you doing? Come on, ask him, like, how are you doing? Because, see, I've been doing a lot of thinking recently about the vision of the church, and I'm finding that just because you start well doesn't mean you get to take your foot off of the gas. You got to keep your foot on the gas when it comes to God. Come on, you remember like when you first started coming to church, when you, maybe it's your first time here, you might be feeling like this right now, but you first started coming, man, the worship was like, you were crying, you were like, oh my God, and the word, it was like, he was speaking to me, you would come, like, pastor, I swear, man, I felt like you were talking right to me. Do you remember? Your foot was on the gas, you were telling everybody, like, man, listen, the city, God, like, it was alive, and then what happened is you started to grow a little bit. And you kind of let your foot off a little bit. You started coasting. But what I found, because I like to drive fast, hello, is that when you put your foot off the gas, you take your foot off the gas, you start to coast off of the momentum that you once had. And when the momentum begins to go away, you try to put your foot on the gas, but the engine goes before it starts to pick up. And see, that's what's happening in a lot of our lives. We've taken our foot off of the gas. We started to coast. We got complacent and comfortable, and now we're not okay. In fact, there's a term. It's called entropy, E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. It's a thermodynamic term. And it's a, it's a term that, that, that I found that I feel like is relevant to our lives and our relationships with God. And it's actually defined as a gradual decline into disorder. So when you let off of the gas, you begin to gradually decline. And as you decline, disorder starts to pop up around you. See, I, I found that When you leave things alone, they don't get better. They get worse. Even the issues in your life that you try to ignore don't get better. They get worse until you deal with them. See, we've got to get out of entropy because we were once here, but now we're like, And it's this gradual, this, this gradual state of, oh, and we're going what feels like riding the momentum of before. You know, I met with a pastor this week. Um, he just started a church in Painesville, and it was one of those moments where, I don't, y'all, listen, I'm just, you know, I got to just tell y'all who I am, right? So I was actually busy doing something else, and uh, I didn't want to do this with him. You know, like, I got a project I'm working on that I need to finish that I knew if I do this, it wasn't going to happen. You know what I'm saying? And the Lord was like, no, I want you to stop doing what you're doing. I want you to do this. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay. And, and, and I said, hey, man, just meet me at the church. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Okay, we got here. And, and, and listen, we started to talk, and I was asking him, I, you know, so I said, listen, if I'm going to go, I'm not going to go, and my heart ain't going to be in it. So I'm like, okay, God, you sending me here. I'm on assignment. This is the assignment for today. Let's go. And I started to talk to him and asking him about how he was doing, and I was, hey, man, what, you know, what's one of the things that you feel like you're struggling with right now and just starting your church? And he started to pour out to me, you know, I was like, well, what do you think that you need right now? And he started to tell me what he needed, and the Lord had told me what he, what he needed was he needed some money. But as he was talking about what he was struggling with, I was like, he's like, man, you know, I'm portable. We got a set up, man. We need a building. And he's going on and on about, you know, like setting up. And I looked at him and I said, you know, we were portable for like seven years. 
I said, you want me to tell you the truth, man? He's like, what? I said, I wish I was still portable. I said, because when we were portable, we had to build the church every week. We had to tear it down. We had over 140 volunteers showing up every single week to build the church because if they didn't build it, we wouldn't have them. And people were mobilized and we were growing like we never grew before. It was two services. We, we were 800 of us in a school. Because we had to build the church. But what happened is you got the building, entropy slipped in. We got comfortable. And the gradual, because I've seen a lot of great churches and a lot of great movements that started really great. And then people got comfortable. And then they got, yeah, well, you know. And So why do we got to multiply? Why do we got to increase? Why do we got to do the things that I'm talking about doing? Because I'm not ready to die. I'm not done growing. I'm not done multiplying and increasing because God still has more for you. Amen. He's still got more. He's still got more. In fact, I was thinking about this a little bit and a friend of mine told me this story. And uh, it's kind of funny because it was a story that he was telling me about this old couple. They had been married for 60 years. Come on, man, I hope I'm married to you for over 60 years. You know what I'm saying? For real. More than 60 years, right? And they were married for 60 years. And you can imagine over 60 years, come on, you know stuff started to get a little stale. You know what I'm saying? Like, they would get it 60 years. And, you know, the intimacy had kind of like, you know, gotten away and they weren't as anymore, you know. And, and one day the, the guy was sitting down watching a little TV and his wife she was feeling a little frisky. So she put on her nightgown, because, you know, we passed 60 years. We passed the lingerie, y'all. <laughs> okay? And, and she put on her nightgown, and, 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 and she walked past her husband, but he didn't look. So she sat down right next to him and started to nibble on his neck a little bit. And as soon as she started nibbling on his neck, he popped up and he got up and started walking out the room. And she was like, honey, 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 oh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, did, did I offend you? Are you, are, 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 are you okay? And he looked back at her and said, babe, no, I'm going to get my teeth so I can nibble too. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, I got to go get my teeth. Come on, man, look at your neighbor and say, you need your teeth. I need your teeth. Better go get your teeth. And, yes, Lord. It, it, and when I was thinking about it, it actually, it reminded me of a scripture in 2 Timothy. And it says that we got to be ready in season and in out of season. In other words, we say at our house, if you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. You know what I'm saying? So when the moment comes, you better have your teeth, brother, you know. And that's the same with God. God has all these opportunities. He has all these things planned for your life, for our life in this church. But we got to be ready for when the opportunities come. We got to be ready. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to keep my teeth, girl. You know what I'm saying? May is going to be in all the time. And, and we know that God has a vision and he has a vision for your life, and it's easy to grab hold of the vision, but it's just as easy to let go of if you're not purposeful in your pursuit. In fact, the Apostle Paul actually says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, and this is something that God is helping me with right now, because I've read this scripture and preached it probably four or five times. But I've all, I missed this first part, and he says, I keep asking. See, so many times as a leader, I'm like, I want to say it, and then you do it, and then you just keep doing it. Come on. How many of y'all got kids, right? And you just want to tell them, and then they should be doing it. And how many times have you said, I told you, meaning this ain't the first time, right? And, and, and listen, but Paul is saying, that's not real, it's not real. 
He said, I keep asking, and God is showing me when it comes to relationships, when it comes to the church and leaders and all that, you can't just say it one time and expect it's going to happen. you got to keep asking and keep saying over and over and over. So I was like, God, and I, I was praying this morning before I came here on my, in my car, and I, I was like, I'm not going to stop asking, God. I keep asking, God, I want people to know who you are. God, let people come who discover who you are. I keep asking, God, let people become free in this room. Let them walk in the, I keep asking, God, let them discover their purpose right here at this church. God, I keep asking, God, what is it? What is the difference that you want us to make as a body? We don't stop. We keep. Everybody say keep. You got to do it over and over and over again. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him. But then he threw this last word, better. Because it's not enough to just to know him. There's more to God than you'll ever be able to discover in your life. So he said, better. God, help me to know you better today than I did yesterday. God, show me more of who you are today than you did. Yet. Like, like your pursuit for him is to know him better. Like I'm trying to learn more about my wife. I can't be satisfied with what I learned 20 years ago when we were dating because then our relationship will be stale. And when she walks by, I'll be like this, right? She walked by. I don't care what's on TV. And she'd be like, well, I wasn't meaning that. Oh, my bad. Don't walk by. You know what I'm saying? Because I stay ready, girl. Right? And that's what we, that's, <laughs> okay. The Bible says, in verse number 18, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, which lets me know that Paul, even though he was kind of like off from an anatomy standpoint, he was right on in the spirit. Because most of us would say, well, Paul, your eyes aren't in your heart, they're in your head. But the truth of the matter is you view the world through your heart, not your head. And when relationship gets to your head, the relationship is off. Because now when you're in your head, you're thinking too much. But when it's flowing from your heart, you've got this joy that becomes inc incomprehensible. So God is saying, listen, I want your eyes that are in your heart to be enlightened so that you can see the world as I see the world. Because I said about David, he had a what? Heart after my own heart. Right? So God is trying to shift that thing. And he says that you may know the hope which he has called you, which you need to know that I'm not the only one in the room who's called. If, if you saw right now, and I know it's like getting ready to be Halloween, but if you saw right now a head come in here with nobody, how would you respond? Would you be like, Oh, wow, there's a head with no body. Or would you be like, what's going on? But it's the same. Because you're called, and 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 you. There is a calling on your life, and on your life, and on your life, and your life too. You are called the same. I had to accept the call. It's the same calling that you have to accept. It may not put you on a platform or a stage, but it will put you in the Lamb's book of life and get you a reward in heaven. It's the same reward. It's the same mission. It's the same vision that we all are moving in the same direction where we're moving together cohesively as a movement and not a building making a difference. And I'm like, okay, God, this is what you're trying to do. He said, yeah, man, I'm trying to get your eyes and your heart open so you can know you got a calling 
right? I need you to discover your purpose. He said that, that listen, there's some riches, which is, is translated as the word promises. There's some promises. You've got an inheritance in his holy people, which lets me know that my promise is attached to what? People. Your inheritance isn't yours, it's ours. And the way you get to your inheritance is together. And what's the inheritance? Well, it's easy. It's found in Psalm chapter 2. In chapter, uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse number 8, it actually says, and I will, it says, ask me, everybody say, ask me, and I will make the nations your what is our inheritance? It's the territories that we've been called and commissioned to take, the cities and the towns we've been called to invade, and the people who are there are our inheritance. Those will be the things that we're going to take with us when we leave here. The Bible says there will be rewards. Two judgments and rewards. Because the only thing we get to take is people. We've been called to invade, to take, and to establish his kingdom in all the earth. So I want to I give you guys a couple of points. Because you can never do what you're supposed to do until you get over your hurts and your hangups. And you'll never get over your hurts and your hangups until you know the God who came to set you free. So if we need to know God and we're taking our temperature, we're doing a, a checkup, the first thing we need to do, and I want you to write this down, is keep a close watch on your spiritual temperature. I'll ask the question again, how are you doing with him? Whether you realize it or not, your spiritual life has a direct impact on the rest of your life. How you're doing spiritually will overflow into how you're living naturally. It has to do with your health, your wealth, and your well-being. Why is that? Because you, my friend, are a spirit. This thing is going back to the dirt. You don't believe me? Go to the cemetery. There's a lot of these there. But you want to know who ain't there? The person. See, your spirit is what remains. So you are a spirit first. So when you take care of your spirit man, your natural man is now taken care of. So we got to take our spiritual temperature. Look at your neighbor say, take your temp. So I got to take care of my spirit. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, verse number 11, it actually says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual what? Come on, that's a hard word. Fervor. It's excitement. Keep your spiritual excitement, your, your fervor. Why? And it says, how do you do that? By doing what? Serving, Serving the Lord. Come on, Listen, this is not your spiritual fervor or this is not your temperature. Oh, man, you know what? I'm too overwhelmed and busy. I'm going to disconnect from the body. Well, let me tell you, anything that disconnects from the body dies. Cut your finger off and leave it there. You, you'll quickly see you'll have four fingers. It is not going to stay alive unless you reattach it to the body. But have you ever heard of somebody who cut their finger off? They kept it on ice, put it back on, and it, it reattached? Yeah, that's real. So, so we can't detach. We got to stay attached, right? We got to stay attached to the body. We got to stay attached. So, so we see, well, 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 what does that look like? So I got to take care of my spirit. Why? Because entropy comes. If you don't take care of your spirit, I'm telling you, I know so many Christians who stop growing after the first year that they met Christ. 20 years in, saying the same thing. Entropy. They stop growing. Hey, I'm struggling. Any of y'all struggling? Come on. You be struggling? Come on, it's a struggle. Yeah, right. The struggle, you real. You know, listen, if people don't raise their hand, listen, don't trust them. They lying. <laughs> you know, it says, it says he who was without sin is a liar. <laughs> so we got to, listen, 
We struggle. We all struggle, but we can't live in struggle. The problem is we want to take up our residence in struggle, but we weren't made for struggle. We were made for triumph. We were made for victory. So we don't do struggle well. Come on, say, I don't struggle. I don't struggle well. I don't. So we've, we, we've done some pretty cool things this year, and, and I'm actually going to have to tell them next time. Uh, actually, December 8th, I'll highlight them when we do our legacy offering because I, I got a whole list of accolades of the things that you and I have done this year, like awesome stuff. I'm talking like we've planted churches. There are churches all throughout the United States that you guys helped plant, and you don't even know. You know, there, there are, uh, I think the number was like 2 million kids this year that have gotten a Bible that was translated in their native language because of you and your generosity. You know, we, we, we've done things like, you know, uh, given to the, the Maya Center, which is a place for women who, you know, decide not to get an abortion but need help. Like, I could go on and on and on about what we have done, but, you know, God is like, well done, city. In fact, in Revelation chapter 2, he, Jesus actually says that. He's like, hey, you know what? I know what you're doing, your hard work. He said, you know what? Your perseverance, you know, he's like, hey, well done. You know what I'm saying? He's like, hey, I see that you, you don't tolerate wicked people. He said, you know, um, you've tested those who claim to be apostles but aren't, and you found them false. He's saying you're doing the right things, and your doctrine is good. Like, what you're preaching is truth, it's authentic, and it's real. He said, well done, man. Like, let, let, let's go, right? That's something to be proud of, y'all, right? Then he goes on to say, you've persevered, and you've endured hardships for my name, and you've not grown weary. You're still showing up. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you're still here, right? You're showing up. But then he says this, yet. You know, that's one of my favorite things I set my kids up. I'd be like, man, you got them good grades on Yet. He says, yet I have this one thing that I hold against you. You've forsaken the love that you had at first. See, don't stop doing those other things, but the problem is, is you've put someone or something in front of me. There's a love that you have forsaken that you had that you no longer have. And listen, this isn't meant to, like, bring the temperature of the room down, although I wish it would. Because this isn't condemnation. That doesn't come from God. That's the devil if you feel condemned. Let me teach you that right here in this moment. That's the devil. Because Jesus said this. He just said, hey, consider how far you've fallen. Take your temperature and see where you're at. And he said, listen, if your temperature is off, he said, repent and do the things that you did. Repent just means turn around. Recognize and be honest and say, I'm going the wrong way. And turn around and start going the other way. And sometimes that's kind of hard, right? It's like going to the gym. People who go to the gym tell you the hardest part about going to the gym is when you first start going to the gym. Once you get in the routine, it's easy, but when you first start going, it's uncomfortable, right? Your body's fighting it. You don't want to do it. You're sore. All these things are coming against you, but once you get through that, all of a sudden, your body begins to change. And would any of us in the room agree that going to the gym is probably a good thing for your body? Yeah. But you got to get over, we've got to get over the fact that we just need to go back to our first love. God, I do love you, but I'm not doing or where I need to be. And just go back. Just go back. Everybody say go back. Go back. Go back. So if you're not where you need to be, just light a fire and let that thing burn again. Number two, we say find family here because finding family results in living in freedom. So you gotta make time for authentic relationships with other believers. We have over 20 groups going on right now. People ask me all the time, hey, do you guys have anything going on during the week? Yep, we got over 20 groups going on right now during the week, right? All you gotta do is go to thecitychurch.org, click on groups, 
We got a whole list of groups. You can look at them, get descriptions of what they are, find one that you think that you would be interested in and go right to the group, right? Because we know that real change happens in the context of relationships, right? It's easier to do it with someone than without. And many of us still need to discover our role. What's your role in the body? So how does entropy seep into discovering your purpose? Well, the way it seeps in is once you find Christ, what happens is you either think too highly of yourself in the wrong way or you don't see yourself worthy enough in the right way. So I want you to write this third thing down. You got to start to see yourself the way that God sees you. There is an identity of yourself that God has for you, and it's a faith view. God sees you through the lens of faith. He doesn't see you where you are. He sees you as he created you to be and what you can become. So he's seeing you through the lens of faith. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, verse number three, the Bible actually says, it says, for the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more, what? Highly than you ought to, right? So he's saying, hey, take your temperature right here. See where you're at. He said, but rather yourself with sober judgment. So he's saying, Get your mind clear. Sober is a clear mind, right? Clear your mind. It says, in accordance with the what? Faith that God has distributed to each of you. It says, for just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, right? It says, so in Christ, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to who? which means you belong to me and I belong to you. And when we come together on a mission and the vision that God has given, this body can do great and mighty things. We've all got different gifts, but we make up one body. Everybody say one body. So let me finish with the fourth one. Because entropy can get into your relationship with God. It can get into your freedom with God. And it can get into your purpose with God. But how does entropy slip into you making a difference? It's simple. You begin to focus more on earth than you do heaven. See, number four is we've got to live for heaven, not earth. You're a spirit being, and the Bible says that you're in this world, but you're not of this world. And maybe you don't know this this morning, but you're not going to stay here forever. Everybody in the room at some point will pass away. And you're going to be wherever you go for eternity, not like a hundred years, a thousand years, not even a million years, but literally forever. And we've got to be careful not to get more enamored about earth than we are about heaven. In fact, in Philippians 3 and 18, the Bible actually says, for I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. Ouch. It says they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. Listen, God wants you to enjoy things. Just don't let them rule you. Go on vacation, please. Go. Go. Because I'm going. <laughs> Eat brisket and good food. But don't let it rule you. Don't let it rule you. It says, and they think only about this life on earth. But he goes on to say in verse number 20, it says, 
but we are citizens of what? Of what? Say it one more time. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. We were created for heaven. And God has designed our earthly experience so that we can get people to heaven. I want you guys to take a look at a video that I want to play real quick. And right after this video, I want you guys to stand to your feet and I'm going to close out our service. Hi, my name's Allie and I am 20 years old and I've been attending the City Church for almost two years now and Pastor Tony recently led a series called This Is My Church and it forever changed my life. So I would ask, where are you going to go and what are you going to do with the gift that you've just been given? Will it be, I'm going to drive around my gift so everyone can see me? Or am I going to use my gift to let everybody know who he is and what he can do? I began to just, at the end of that series, as I was driving home on the last Sunday that that series ended, I just started thinking of, wow, what this church has done for me and the impact that it has had on my life. And I decided to, to make a post on social media. I wasn't forced to or anything. Um, I just felt it on my heart that people need to know what's happening here. I feel like for me personally, church used to kind of be something that I was forced to go to, you know, because I grew up in my parents' household. Um, but it never was really something that I could connect to or relate to, uh, just because there wasn't a lot of people really my age or anyone that I could relate to. And when I went to college um, is when I kind of went my own way and kind of fell astray to the Lord. I kind of got to the point where I didn't really want to go to church. I didn't have that passion. When I first started coming to the city church, my best friend actually drug me here. And I remember pulling up in the parking lot and it was really cold and when I walked in, there were just a bunch of warm faces. <laughs> Everyone was so like excited to, to greet you, to meet you right at the door, to say hello, get to know you. And what really drew me in was just seeing everybody sing and so excited about Jesus. I remember Pastor Tony speaking. I don't remember exactly the message, but just his passion. They were amazed that they had never seen the fact that someone would love somebody else and do whatever it took by ripping a roof off of a house to get their friend there. The sermon wasn't just words, but it also was God breathed, like it was straight from the word. And that's what I really appreciated. A year and a half ago, I was like, okay, I wanna get involved. And that next Sunday, I was holding a sign out in the parking lot. <laughs> And I remember like feeling a little funny. Like at first I'm like, what am I doing? Like I'm just holding the sign like, but hey, I'm here. <laughs> the first small group I joined, we just became family. Um, like some of those girls, we still hang out, you know, outside of that group. And I get to have a group of girls my age that love the Lord, that serve the Lord. Um, and I know that when we get together, we're gonna have a good time. And then I also joined the softball league this summer, which I am terrible at softball. <laughs> Somehow we won that tournament and we should not have. And so my experience with groups uh, has been super fun to build that community and that friendship. I remember um, hearing about like Infuse for the first time with Pastor Faith. She is amazing. I could cry. <laughs> she has discipled me, mentored me, 
over the past few months uh, and has just been such a, an impact on my life and someone that I really value and cherish in my life. I mean, if our church wasn't here, I wouldn't be here. And I would still struggle with a lot of the things that I struggled with in the past um, as far as mental health, um, how I saw myself, where we have broken people being able to come in week after week and we just say, hey, there's nothing too dirty that God cannot make worthy. And that, that's Jesus showing up here every week, transforming not only my life, um, but anyone that walks into these doors. Uh, I've seen people walk in here and leave here not the same way, but forever changed, including myself. If someone were to ask me, um, why, why should I attend the City Church? Why should I um, start getting more involved? Why should I serve? Why should I give? Whether that's of my time, my treasure, my talent, this is uh, what I would say. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So why is it important? The reason it's important is because just like Allie, you have a story that God is writing. And that story is a story that God thought of so many years before you made that mistake, you went the wrong way, or you made the wrong choice. Why do we need a vision? Because God wants you to know him like he knows you. Why do we need freedom? Because it's time for us to let go. There is a purpose in you that has been trying to emerge through you since you were a child. Because you've always been created. You've been made to make a difference. And see, all over this region, this state, and this world are stories of people who are crying out for the answer that is found in Christ. The Bible says that the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. We're not living in the worst age. We're living in the best age. This moment that God decided to birth you into the world was for this moment because you have the opportunity to be a part of a movement because we're not an organization, we're an organism, a living, breathing body created to reach those who are far from him. So I'm going to ask you again, how are you doing? I want you to close your eyes this morning, bow your heads. How are you doing in your relationship? Do you need to know them better? How are you doing right now with your freedom? Are there some things that you need to let go of? Well, if so, come on up for prayer. Get in a group. Take your mask off so that you can be set free. 
Are you struggling with why you're even here? God has a plan. For some of you, your difference-making ability is going to change your family for the rest of your life. So if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus and you'd like to come into a relationship with him, I just want you to slip your hand in the air and say, that's me. I want to, I want to get saved today. I want to know him. Like maybe I, I did know him at one time, but the truth is my, the fire is out. I, I, I'm far from him right now and I need to turn and I need to go back to my first love. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand in the air. I'll pray. Amen. And for the rest of you, I'm going to invite you to check on yourself. But I'm going to invite you to go on this journey with us. This journey where we see a little church from Ashtabula, Ohio, that people won't even be able to pronounce, that will go and see cities, towns, and villages, all for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for this message. I thank you, God, that you're bigger than a building, that you care about me individually. And this morning, God, I know that you love me and are calling me, which is why I feel the way that I feel right now. So, God, I want to just ask first, God, that you would forgive me, God, for anything that I've done to offend you. Anything I've said, any decision I've made, God, I ask that you would wash me and cleanse me of my unrighteousness. And God, I ask that you would fill me, God. Fill me with your spirit, God. Give me the eyes of my heart, God. Let them be clear so that I can see. God, I pray, God, that you would help me in my relationship with you. You would surround me with people who love you, care for you, and will lift me up. Father, I pray, God, that I would not live this life without walking in my purpose. Because, God, I believe and I've always believed that I was created to make a difference. So I'm not going to stand still. I'm not going to sit any longer. But I'm going to stand. I'm going to lift my hand and say, God, if you want to send somebody, send me. So, Father, I thank you, God, for this word, and I thank you, God, for this vision. Help us to be obedient as we become the body of believers you've always believed we could be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching the City YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a video, and feel free to even share this with a friend. You can also support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button below to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus. Thank you again for watching, and we're so thankful for your life, and we can't wait to see you soon.